Good afternoon, everybody. So what's left after 150 years? Well, the answer is quite a lot. I'd like to illustrate the point by briefly highlighting a few examples of both the rich documentary history and some of the relics that remain on the ground, particularly in Central Australia, where I've spent some time. This has been my own journey, but there is plenty of scope for further exploration. My early interest was in the construction process. I was intrigued by the sheer physical challenges and manual effort that were obviously involved in building the line, yet most of the books on the subject don't say very much about them. The diary of Thomas Frederick Smith, a young jack of all trades attached to the central construction parties, was my starting point. The battered original of Smith's saddlebag diary is in our state library collection. His diary was the closest I and others had come to, the, to a first-hand description of the hole digging, pole cutting, well sinking, butchering, blacksmithing, and many other physical tasks, not to mention sheer survival. He was a glutton for punishment because he subsequently joined Richard Nucky's re-polling party after the completion of the line. But he scrubbed up pretty well. You can read more about Smith's experiences in my essay, Building the Line, or dip into his diary. Oops. I later followed the explorations of John Ross. He was looking to find a pathway for the OTL through the central ranges. Combining the 1960s researches of Major General Symes with my own bushwalking experiences near well-known locations such as Trophina Gorge, that Ross traversed through the East Macdonald Ranges, I concluded that Ross was torn by conflicting objectives that he just couldn't resolve. He was understandably drawn to a path through the tortuous hill country that would give his small party the best chance of finding water. So he balked at aiming further to the west across the drier and lower rolling country seen here from Mount Georgina and looking across towards Alice Springs in the distance, which would have better suited the heavy wagons that were to follow. As a result, he recommended a telegraph route through the hills well to the east that he hadn't even seen. In the end, Ross seemed unable to swallow his pride and turn back to try again in another direction. Now to survey uh, Gilbert McMinn. Where Ross failed to find a path, McMinn succeeded. I was intrigued by McMinn's diary story and state records of his struggle across Larapinta Valley in the wet and bog from Temple Bar to Simpson's Gap, another well-known landmark. This sketch of the gap is from his diary. He left nothing tangible behind there, but this area is right next to the Larapinta Trail, and I was keen to see what he had seen. On the right of this photo is Hat Hill, just on the east side of Simpson's Gap, behind which McMinn climbed up to the rather forbidding escarpment. Looking up from just below it, he recorded in his diary, I was in hopes when I started that I would have been able to get on the top, this being the highest point about, but after getting up about 700 feet, the hill becomes very precipitous and will take a climber with a better head than I have to reach the top. Nevertheless, from his high vantage point, he had a clear view across the valley to his entry point at Temple Bar. Then scanning eastward with his telescope, he had a clear view across the, I'm sorry, then scanning eastward with his telescope, he concluded famously, the south side of range that we have come through seems to be continuous, but all north of that is very much broken up. If these are the McDonnell Ranges, I can see no difficulty in getting about in an easterly direction. It took another search by William Mills a couple of weeks later to confirm it and find and name the Alice Spring, but McMinn was right. And so to the north. After focusing initially on events in the south and centre, I was conscious that I knew very little about what had gone on in the north except that it had been a story of cascading disasters. So I decided to take a closer look 
particularly at the various diaries, the real primary sources. These diaries have delivered up a number of new insights, and I'll touch briefly on a few. A key to the story was the 60,000-word personal diary of Robert, leader Robert Patterson. He was given an impossible task by the Hart government. He calculated correctly that his parties would have to progress the work at over 3.8 miles per day to finish by the due date, six times faster than the other parties were achieving. Various books on the OTL give conflicting accounts of the actual time of day of Patterson's final joining ceremony on August the 22nd. The time was 3.15 p.m., as shown clearly in Walter Rutt's at the top and Patterson's diary extracts here. Though Robert Patterson was greatly humiliated by reports from Queensland after the completion of the line, it has never been quite clear who it was there who actually wielded the knife. It now appears that it was the Premier of Queensland himself who was the original source of his embarrassment. It seems the wily Mr Palmer had subtly probed the younger Patterson during a hail fellow well-met audience with him, extracting just enough to twist and leak to the Queensland press to pan the South Australian line. There had been a few lighter moments, though. One such was when Charles Todd was nearly at the end of a long speech to the men on the Northern Line, extolling their virtue for having stoically endured the priva privations of the wet season. When puzzled by why bursts of laughter suddenly erupted, Todd had to be enlightened that he was not toasting the poor souls who had suffered three hungry monks a months in the mosquito-ridden swamps. His audience was actually the men he had brought up with him on the Omeo. I'm sure there are many more interesting stories yet to emerge. And now to the physical relics. Rather than talk about the more familiar telegraph stations, I'll focus here on the line itself and some of its lesser known relics. Some words on the telegraph poles. The first ones were mostly made of wood, and as far as I know, None of these typically river red gum poles have survived the fires, floods and termites of the past century and a half. A small number of heritage listed calytrus or native pine poles remain though, notably near Pine Creek in the top end. They were termite resistant, straight and easy to cut, being softwoods. There were several variants of iron pole, as Sir Derek has mentioned earlier, these included the familiar 19-foot, three-section, prefabricated Oppenheimer. Some of these were used on the original line where suitable timber was scarce, but most were used to replace the wooden poles during the repoling program. Later, the single-section, tapered Siemens pole appeared, and as you can see, this had a separate base that could be driven, uh, driven directly into the soft soil, a real labour saver. A few years ago, I joined a bush trip with several Alice Springs locals to search for OTL relics well south of Alice Springs at the location where the second major construction depot was built early in 1871. On the way there, we passed the line at this picturesque spot in the depot sandhills, where even the second copper wire is still hanging on the poles. That indicates just how inaccessible and remote this area is. The depot location itself is quite a treasure trove of small artefacts, as shown in these photos courtesy of Barry Allwright. This is a bullock queue, a bullock or camel bell, and a triangular file. The cut lines on the file are still clearly visible. Oddly, one of the most significant finds at this depot was this short length of galvanised wire, which, when first found, was just protruding from the ground. When excavated, it extended about half a metre down and was deliberately coiled at the bottom. It was associated with the long-gone depot store building described by Thomas Smith in his diary, the first European building built anywhere in central Australia. The Owen Springs Reserves contains relics, re Reserve contains relics of the original 1871 line following Stewart's track up the Hugh River. 
using surveyor Charles Winnicke's very large scale 1881 map, and there's a copy full size out in the foyer, we were able to establish the OTL route accurately enough to locate and leave in situ about 70 relics spread over the full 45 kilometre length of the line in that reserve. Amongst other things, we found a number of these hoop iron collars or ferrules. These were nailed around the top of the original wooden poles before the insulator pins were inserted to prevent the timber from splitting. It's mind-boggling to think that, the, that while the wooden poles themselves disappeared long ago, there are still thousands of these rusty survivors scattered along the line. 